sermon this afternoon be a little bit different as far as what we normally hear. I try to keep all of my sermons as fundamental and basic as they can, even when we are moved to study some things that are a little more meaty than others. I still try to emphasize those basics without which we do not have a proper foundation to build anything more meaty, if you please, on. Sometimes in studying, there are some, I think, rather intriguing, intriguing inquiries when you're going through the literature, especially of the Old Testament. And I think this being with a lot of people is rather mysterious and in the King James Version, it's referred to as the angel of the Lord. And in the American Standard and maybe other versions, it's referred to as the angel of Jehovah. Genesis 16, 7 through 14. Sometimes it's referred to as the angel of God. Genesis 21, 17 through 19. But now these two expressions, the angel of the Lord, or the angel of Jehovah and the angel of God, I say two expressions because that's what we're talking about, just Lord and King James, Jehovah and American Standard. The angel of God and the angel of Jehovah are, have to do with the same entity. I might cite for your further study Judges chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. Judges 6, 20 and 21. Nevertheless, the question remains just exactly who is this person, this angel of the Lord, this angel of God? Well, let's ask first of all, what is an angel? Now, over the last number, 20, 30 years or whatever, you've heard all sorts of things about angels, angels this and so forth. And like a lot of other things, people who use terms like that, I don't know what concept they have in their mind of an angel. It can be a very subjective thing, and you'd have to say, tell me what you mean by angel, and no telling what you'll hear. That'd be a good survey for somebody to take up. It's just, man on the street, what is an angel? Brett, do you think they'd be a good work for the deacons? <laughs> anyway, I think probably the word angel is about as mysterious to some people as this angel of the Lord or the angel of Jehovah. What is the meaning of the term angel? Well, the Hebrew word anglicized, M-A-L-A-C, malak. And it just simply, its root basic meaning is messenger. The nature of the messenger, let me emphasize that, the nature of the messenger is going to have to be determined by the very context in which the word is found. What do we mean by context? Well, we mean the literary environment in which the word is used. Who's speaking? Who's being spoken to? What's the subject under consideration? That sets the context. It could be a messenger of a heavenly order, such as the normal usage people have of angel as a spirit being in heaven, such as Gabriel or Michael. That's what people at least ordinarily have in common may refer to angel, Genesis 32 and verse 1. But it may mean also a human messenger operating on behalf of somebody else. If you look in Genesis 32 and verse 2, you see that Jacob sends out emissaries, and that would be the same thing as messengers or Angels in the generic sense. 
On the other hand, angel of the Lord or Jehovah stands in a class completely by itself. Now, I think a consideration of the Old Testament, well, the relevant Old Testament scriptures can help us conclude, first of all, that the messenger of the Lord himself possessed characteristics, underscore characteristics, that can only be ascribed to deity. Yet this is being distinguished from another person who is also designated as the Lord Jehovah, according to which version you use it. The third point is the messenger of Jehovah or the Lord is to be identified, and this is what we'll, I hope, be able to prove by preponderance of the evidence, is identified with the pre-incarnate word Jesus Christ. So I want us to address each one of these, if you want to call them propositions, and that is that the messenger of the Lord is a divine being, not a created being, created spirit being or human being. And I think you just simply have to take all the texts that have this involved and connected with it relating to the messenger of the Lord that you will see that he's not in a common angelic class. And don't forget, spirit beings such as Gabriel or Michael are spirit beings. They are created beings. First of all, notice that the angel of the Lord, that this is said about him, he promises to multiply Hagar's seed. And she confesses this. You are a God who sees, Genesis 16, 10, and 13. Yet it's the messenger of the Lord, or Jehovah, that is being spoken of, the angel of the Lord. But she says, you are a God who sees, speaking of that messenger of God. Then the messenger called Abraham, saying, By myself I have sworn, says American Standard Jehovah, Genesis 22, 15, and 16. And he said to Jacob, I am the God of Bethel, Genesis 31, 11, and 13. And it was this messenger who wrestled with Jacob, Hosea 12 and verse 4, at Peniel. And yet, the sacred text identifies the person as God. Genesis 32, 28 through 30, Hosea 12, 3 through 5. This messenger spoke to Moses from the burning bush, referring to himself as God. Exodus 3, 2, and the verses following. I don't know if hardly anybody that believes in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Old Testament that doesn't accept that to be God speaking to Moses from the bush that was not burned up. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the messenger of which we speak attributed to himself the divine oath. And then another point, the prince of Jehovah, the prince of the Lord, accepted worship. And spoke as God, Joshua 5, and verse 13 through chapter 6 and verse 2. The same thing appears in, again, Judges 6, 19 through 27. Judges 6, 19 through 27. Now you'll remember that when you go into the book of Revelation, that ordinary angels created spirit messengers refuse to be worshipped. Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. 
Now, there were a number of Old Testament worthies. We call this person God. And that designation that he is God was never repudiated, never set apart or altered. So there is, in the light of these things, a vast amount of evidence leading to the conclusion that the messenger of Jehovah, the angel of Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, was a divine being. Now, let's look at the messenger of Jehovah as being distinct from Jehovah. might learn something about this. I, I'll pause here and say, for those who were in the class last year on the Godhead, you should be able to draw from that some things that will help you understand why some of these terms are used as they are. But we may make comment further on that. So in spite of the fact that this holy messenger is endowed with the traits of deity, he is also distinguished from Jehovah. Repeatedly, he is designated as the messenger of the Lord or Jehovah. And yet he is Jehovah himself and he's acting on behalf of another who's also Jehovah. Well, let me pause here and bring up some of what we studied in that class to understand God. When we say there is one God, we are saying there is one divine essence that is eternal. There are three persons who possess or are part of or however we could say it with our limited speech of that essence. Thus, the first person, second person, and third person of that one divine essence or the Godhead. It must be understood that therefore, we'll say more about that in a moment, that therefore each one of the Godhead three may be referred to as Jehovah because it's referring to the one divine essence. In Exodus 23, beginning in verse 20, I'm again referring now as it's used in the American Standard Version, Jehovah promised the children of Israel that he would send an angel before them as they sojourned in the wilderness of Sinai. That particular messenger would keep them and bring them finally into the land of Canaan. And I want to pause here and remind you that especially under the law of Moses and all things pertaining thereto, those things pertain to types or shadows of the real thing in the New Testament. Israel, fleshly Israel, is a type of the church. So keep that in mind. The Hebrews were warned to listen to his voice and to not provoke him. Because if they did not listen to him, if they did not hearken to him, if they did provoke him by disobedience, then he would not forgive their transgressions. Well, what happened when the people murmured after they left Egypt? And they murmured against Moses, who was God's, of course, chosen leader. Well, that kept on for a little bit, but then guess what? Once they're told, and a few months after they left Egypt, go up and take the land, the spies came back, two of them said, oh, we can do it. Ten others said, no, we can't. They're giants in the land. We can't do this. Which said to God, we don't believe you can take us and take that land. How soon they forgot how they left Egypt and under a mighty hand how they left Egypt and how God delivered them. How he took them through the Red Sea, baptized as Paul said unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and delivered them. Now they can't take the land. So what does God do? You'll wander in this wilderness till everybody 
20 years old and upward are dead except for Joshua and Caleb. Now that is a very important point to understand about the church in the wilderness, fleshly Israel, a type of the church as we are spiritual Israel with Christ as the head of the church of the body. So they were warned, don't provoke him or you will suffer. Jehovah said, for my name is in him, verse 21. Now, does that suggest something to you? It suggests the messenger is a supernatural being. And all of the passages we looked at carries with it that same idea in trying to figure out who this messenger of God or this angel of Jehovah or the Lord is. But you need to note the distinction between my and him in this because we're pointing out that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead three, first, second, third person of the Godhead, are individual persons, but yet they possess they're part of the eternal essence. The eternal essence manifests itself in those three persons in the very nature of God, and that would be seen in the attributes of God. Omnipresent, omnipowerful, and so on. Omniscient. I think it would be appropriate at this point to, accept, to anticipate a question that at least I think many sincere students thinking these things through, doubtless south, namely this, and maybe it's already come in your mind in view of what we've said. How can this being be both Jehovah and yet a messenger from Jehovah? Well, I hope I've helped on that a little bit by my comments concerning the one deity, the one divine essence do you remember that when Moses asked the one speaking to him in the bush about who can I say sent me concerning going back to uh, Pharaoh to free the people? Who, 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 who is it? And he said, I am. I am that I am. There's no point when he wasn't. There's no point in our future when he won't, <laughs> when he won't be. He is. He's always is. There's never been any state, can't say time, you can, but it won't cover it all, when he was not. He is. Now, when the Lord, second person of the Godhead, the eternal word, John 1, 1 and 14, When he, as we've studied on Wednesday night, when he was told by the leaders of the Jews, you're not yet 50 years old. And this temple was, took 48 years to build. And all this kind of thing. Comes down to Abraham. And he says, you remember? Before Abraham was, I am. Same I am that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Because all three possess the divine essence. They are the one God. And each one has an assignment, for lack of a better way to put it, is finite human beings to do the thing they do. It was not the assignment of the Father to tabernacle in the flesh and do what Christ did. It was not the work of the Holy Spirit to do that. And it wasn't the work of the Holy Spirit to do what Christ did. And so on. Each one has a work to fulfill. That's the reason we talk about the second person of the Godhead being the agent through whom the Father or deity, and all of them are deity because they all have the divine essence, did what they did and do what they do. Now, 
Is the designation Jehovah or the Lord, as it's used here, applied to more than one divine person? And the answer is yes. That's our point. Now we come to that word Jehovah, which I mentioned, I think, in class this morning, is a relatively new word in the English language. It was coined to try to take the place of the Tetragrammaton, which is Yahweh, which the Jews, as I said this morning, no matter how well they know Old Testament Hebrew, do not know how the ancient Israelites pronounce this word. They supply, so they can say it, they supply, as we have it transliterated in English, the vowels such as A and E. Well, you just try to pronounce even in English Y-H-W-H. <laughs> try to pronounce that. And you can't do it. Well, in Hebrew, you got the same situation. It's just in Hebrew characters. Now, why do they do that? Because they held God's name so highly and in great reverence, they did not want to pronounce it. Most of the time, they pronounce Adonai. And we have that translated usually as Lord. But in this case, when we talk about the one Lord, the one Jehovah, we need to understand that we're speaking of the same thing. And this word, Yahweh, we'll, we'll call it. More people nowadays are tending to use the word Yahweh than Jehovah. It's actually derived from a, a root word, hara in Hebrew, or hava, which means to be or being. It suggests that deity is absolutely self-existent. That's one reason it's found in this word. Words have meanings. Words convey ideas. Words aren't just wasted. And when God uses a word, there's a reason for using it. So it is a fitting appellation, I think, for each of the persons within the Trinity. Since each of these is characterized by eternality. They have no beginning or ending. The Holy Spirit can say, I am, just like Jesus did. Jesus can say it. The Father can say it. Because they all are of the one, single, solitary, eternal, divine essence. That manifests itself in the attributes of God. So I don't think we should be surprised, therefore, to see references to more than one person who is referred to as Jehovah, as the American Standard does. And uh, sometimes it does so even in the same passage. Now, in our book we're studying on Sunday morning on Isaiah, in the American Standard, Isaiah declared, Thus saith Jehovah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts. Chapter 44, verse 6. This is one reason you have in predictions of Christ that, he, that he's called even everlasting Father. How is that so? Well, you remember, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How could he say that? They're all the same. One eternal, eternally, our eternal divine essence. No beginning or ending. They're all I am. <laughs> Yet they speak as individual persons. We shouldn't think they're separated as three of us are separated. They're not. So there is a mystery about the Godhead that we don't know now. So uh, as I said when we started that class last year, when you study it, you'll learn a lot more about it. But there'll also be a lot, a lot of mystery still around it when. <laughs> When you finish it. Now, the third point. The messenger of Jehovah, as I said, and I've already come to that conclusion, the pre-incarnate Christ. Because I think there could be a very strong case made for the fact that the messenger of Jehovah, who, of course, operated on behalf of or in the interest of the Hebrew people in the Old Testament, was none other than the divine word who became flesh and dwelt among men, John 1, 1 and 14, who, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, to say this further in argument form, as the Old Testament narrative 
draws to a close. The last prophet of the Old Testament speaks of the coming ministry of John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ. Malachi 3 in verse number 1. And you look over in Matthew 11.10, you'll see virtually a divine commentary on Malachi 3.1. Now concerning John, God or Jehovah says, He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant whom ye desire, behold, he cometh. It's hard to understand that passage if you don't understand the divine three. That the one divine essence is the one God, the one deity of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Note in this case the expression messenger of the covenant. Now, if you go back and look at the ancient uh, Jews, they held this passage to be a reference to the coming Messiah. The New Testament, I think, makes this point very clear. Uh, and so conservative Bible scholars, if you pick up those who, when I say conservative, I mean they believe the Bible is the plenary verbal inspired word of God. Every original word and all of it was breathed out from God, inspired, theophanustos. Thus, they believe that you can take it for what it says, unless there's reasons to take it figuratively. So they think it's the angel of the Lord or Jehovah, or the messenger of God. That is, the messenger of the covenant is the messenger of God or Jehovah, the angel of Jehovah. So very prominent, of course, in, in Hebrew scriptures. So they think it's, it's, it's Jesus in his pre-incarnate state. He is the executor of the Father's will before he ever becomes Christ. He becomes Christ in the flesh because he is the executor of the Father's will. And that's the reason the Father didn't and the Holy Spirit didn't also. And to this may be added the inspired testimony of Paul who by inspiration affirmed the actual presence of Christ as a sustaining companion of Israel in the wilderness. And he did that writing the Corinthians, the first Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4. Listen to what he said. Sometimes we may not realize these things or what they are until we start looking at them in the context of it. We don't know this from the Old Testament. We know this from the New Testament, but it's about the Old Testament. Let me just read to you from the first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice it says, Moreover, brethren, I'm continuing on. Moreover means continuing on. Brethren, you brethren at Corinth, our brothers and sisters at Corinth of years ago, members of the church, I would not that you should be ignorant. I'm fixing to enlighten you. If you don't know this, I'm fixing to enlighten you. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Well, clouds, water vapor. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I've already made reference to this. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Remember the typology? And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. One of the things we've got to understand about why Moses got in hot water, and that's not a play on words. It's like we use that term today, got in trouble with God. It wasn't just because 
He disobeyed God the second time around, getting water out of the rock. But it was because he violated a type of the Christ. And thus, he sinned and was not allowed to go in to the land of Canaan. Now, we don't know about this typology till we read it from the Holy Spirit through Paul right here. We don't know about that rock, and that rock was Christ. Well, it's pretty clear that rock from whence the water came, and that fits into Christ declaring all his on this earth, that he offered living water of which if a man would drink, they would never thirst again. So when he did what he did, that is Moses, he violated a type. Yes, he disobeyed God, and therefore he violated a type. But he's a type of Christ. Christ doesn't sin. But he did here. And we see then, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Christ is going to save everybody that, was, that could be saved under the Mosaic age through their faithful adherence to God under the law of Moses. They never had what we have. But it all pointed to this. That's the burden of the book of Hebrews to Jewish Christians who were about to give it all up and go back under the law of Moses. They missed the whole point. They didn't see all this typology. They didn't realize the law as they ought to have. But now here we have Paul telling us clearly. For they drank of that spiritual rock and thought that followed them, see, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now look at verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Because he's concentrating here upon the children of Israel and their wanderings and the sins they committed. But the point is, in getting there, he makes it clear that the water coming out of the rock at the behest of Moses was indicative of the Christ to come who would offer us living water, of which if we drink, as he told the woman at the well in Samaria, you'll never thirst again no study of Christ therefore can afford to overlook the angel of Jehovah in the Old Testament such simply I think was a preview of the approaching messenger from God I listen to John in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God without him was not anything made that was made in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. And then he goes on into John. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word, its pre-incarnate state, was doing the same thing regarding fleshly Israel in guiding it. And so the prophets declared. And if they didn't obey him, they would be destroyed and that's what happened and we've got the record of it all of that preparatory to the coming of our Lord in the flesh who declares at the end of his time on earth having completed perfectly after being tempted in every point like we are yet without sin what the father came to have him do and being sinless he died on the cross gave his body a sacrifice for sin, his blood shed for the remission of sins, thereby purchasing the church. What is the church? It's spiritual Israel. Who is its king? Jesus. Who is that? It fits so perfectly. The angel of Jehovah. Does that sound right? Jesus declared, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Who is our messenger today? Who is the way, the truth, and the life? And no man comes to the Father but by me, the messenger of Jehovah. Thus, the Hebrews writer would begin by pointing out clearly that in the old times, God spoke to man in different ways, to different degrees. 
But in these last days is spoken unto us by his son, messenger of Jehovah, one of the Godhead, three in the flesh. I think it all harmonizes. I think it helps us answer a question that sometimes seems quite mysterious, that the angel of Jehovah is nothing more than, that's not to belittle it when I say nothing more, but don't make anything out of it less than what it is, but try to get just what it is, and that is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is one reason we shouldn't think of Christ just beginning his work when he starts working as a man on earth. He was God doing what the second person of the Godhead does for all things ever begin in his earthly ministry. That's why we call it his earthly ministry. He was doing the work the executor of the Father's will does before this world ever came in. In fact, without him was not anything made that was made. Thus, through him... The worlds are framed. The worlds are created. All of this fits together. Some of it seem, may seem more vague than others, but I think it's a worthy study and to challenge your minds a little more than maybe what we do sometimes to look into that and know that God still speaks to us today through His Son, the messenger of God to us. If you're not a Christian today, we urge you to become one by accepting the truth of Jesus Christ that he is the Son of God, that he's the only Savior of the world, to believe with all your heart that he is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've wandered away in some way or the other, we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the messenger of Jehovah, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.